comics and video games have gone hand in hand for decades. Though the quality in regards to turning print media into a digital playable experience hasn't always worked out in the gamers and the developers favor. But as the years progressed and technology grew more capable of handling the enormous worlds once reserved for ink presentations, video game developers staked their claim and hoped to provide fans of both video games and comics a chance to enjoy both hobbies at one time. Telltale Games did a masterful job embracing the eccentric space odyssey that is Guardians of the Galaxy several years ago. Now the team, Eidos Montreal, behind the most recent Deus Ex and Tomb Raider games, has the opportunity to give gamers a taste of true greatness as well. Though marketed differently than Marvel's Avengers, I came into this one cautiously with a hope that it'll deliver where its Marvel Universe companion did not, and providing a truly memorable experience for all the right reasons. Unlike other games featuring teams where players can take control of every major member, Guardians of the Galaxy only allows gamers to embrace their inner Star-Lord by fully playing as only Peter Star-Lord Quill. After a mission through the quarantine zone goes wrong and the group is arrested and fined by the Galactic Law Enforcement Federation Nova Corps, the Guardians are forced on a journey to get enough money and units to pay the fine and avoid being stuck in the middle of space without a functional ship. For the player, completing the task of freeing Quill and crew of their financial debt eventually becomes least important due to certain decisions the player makes and the rising threat that is rooted in the game's source material more than its cinematic counterparts. Like the presentation in general, completing Guardians of the Galaxy is relatively simple, with the majority of its trophies and achievements coming courtesy of playing through the story on any of the four difficulty levels. There are many types of collectibles, including 45 different outfits for the Guardians that only add cosmetic flair and don't add in-game or combat-oriented buffs for wearing, say Drax's Guardians of the Galaxy movie-inspired outfit. After nearly 25 hours, I finished the story on the game's equivalent of normal difficulty, gathered almost all the collectibles including every outfit, started a new game plus run to attain battle specific trophies that I missed, focusing on killing a particular enemy with one of the Guardians' random call to action attacks to attain my latest platinum trophy. Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy sticks to the more linear presentation associated with licensed games from days gone by compared to Marvel's Avengers. Every chapter sees the player controlling Peter Quill in a new environment, though some chapters have the Guardians backtracking after some catastrophic moments, blasting bad guys, solving relatively easy puzzles, and potentially going the unbeaten path to discover collectibles and or materials used to gain one of Star-Lord's 15 perks. As noted, the player only fully controls Quill in battle. With his blasters, Star-Lord is able to shoot enemies until the gun runs out of ammo, something that will happen frequently as the blasters are underwhelming in their damage output. During the reload animation is a Gears of War-like mechanic, where if the player hits the fire button at the right time, inside the green bars and not the larger red ones, the blasters will automatically reload and shoot a more damaging shot. The most interesting aspect in Star-Lord's arsenal is his element attacks. By hitting the directional pad on the console's controller, Quill can switch between ice, electric, wind, and plasma fire rounds while using the alternate shoot button. That too can run out of ammo before automatically refilling a lot slower than Quill's regular blasters without the gears' minigame. Elemental attacks play a big role in handling certain enemies like the spiky jello monsters succumbing to ice attacks and becoming brittle to the touch or blast. Electric attacks that work on vulnerable enemies will actually spread the shock so nearby adversaries will be stuck in an electrified field. Wind acts as a tether to pull enemies closer and works incredibly well to stop those pesky snipers later in the game when one shot from them can take a quarter of Quill's health. And Plasma, which is introduced incredibly late in the story, of course sets enemies on fire. Foes have little indicators by their health bars to alert players of what element type they're weak to, making it a lot less of a trial and error issue, especially when the numbers start growing greater against the Guardians. Though Quill is the only playable character in battle, his allies aren't just in the background. At any given time, Star-Lord will have every Guardian on the battlefield fighting alongside him. 
With each successful battle and mission comes experience points that provide skill points. Every guardian has up to two special attacks that can be purchased, with one already unlocked at the start of the game, and another that unlocks for each character after a particular story moment. Pulling up an on-screen menu that slightly slows down time during a fight, players can select one of the guardians' available special attacks, like Rocket raining down a slew of grenades, or Gamora performing a trio of debilitating strikes with her sword. Groot will use its limbs to tie down enemies, while Drax can steamroll his way through a gaggle of enemies with his Batista-like clotheslines. Everyone's special attacks run on a cooldown meter, so they can't be used constantly in short periods of time. The special attacks from the semi-controllable guardians also affect an enemy stagger bar. As per the norm, when an enemy stagger meter is full, said foe is vulnerable to attacks without retaliation. Some of the game's weaker enemies and grunts have no meters. Quill also has special attacks such as dispensing an absurd amount of bullets into an enemy for a short period of time while hovering above the ground. But his perks are more important due to the fact Star-Lord isn't a tank, only taking a few significant shots from enemies before before dying. Thanks to Peter's perks, players can give Quill better tools for damage avoidance to complement his always ready to use jet boots, including a dodge ability that slows down time if the player is able to dodge right before Star-Lord is struck. On the offensive side of things, Quill can gain a charge shot or rapid reload perk to really help obliterate foes fast. However, the other Guardians don't get perks in the game. Another big combat implementation is the huddle. As the characters do damage, a meter in the screen's right corner will fill. The huddle option becomes available. Activating a huddle, all the guardians join Peter in this interactive cutscene where the player must choose the right thing to say. If successful, Quill's speech will restore everyone's health, remove the cooldown meter on special attacks, and buff the power of said attacks. It's a nice mechanism that is perfect for those hectic boss battles and late game fights. One of the game's weakest aspects in regards to combat has to be melee. On more static enemies, Quill can perform a combo of physical strikes that usually do very little damage. A majority of the time getting in close for those strikes will result in Star-Lord being hit or even knocked down. Quill also suffers from ragdoll physics, and there will be times when Star-Lord is knocked down and prone to a bunch of shots and melee strikes before the game resets him and puts Quill on his feet. The checkpoint system is forgiving, but still can cause some annoying moments when a battle suddenly goes awry. While not as frequent as fisticuffs and shootouts are the few galactic dogfights and flight sequences. Unfortunately, these airborne scenarios both feel clunky and underwhelming, with enemy attacks being rather easy to avoid, while flying through hazardous objects proves rarely hazardous, with the ship's laser usually destroying anything in its path with one hit. Moving throughout the chapters will show just how important the Guardians are to succeeding. Complications when trying to get through an area will see the player requesting Groot to form a temporary bridge, Rocket hack a terminal, or burrow his way through a small hole, Gamora cut through cables or vines blocking a pathway, and Drax moving heavy objects to make a new platform. Quills' elemental abilities also play a role in traversal, including freezing cold steam to create ice platforms and using his wind tether as a winch. Not to mention his patented mask, his visor, marking objects for his allies to do their thing and helping them progress. Thankfully, the puzzles don't get too complicated or frequent, not wasting the player's time after they figure out the method to the game's madness. The narrative isn't that remarkable or memorable, as it doesn't do much differently than any other games in the genre and beyond. What stands out is the character interactions both automatically and through the player's own discretion. Players may find a particular collectible that Quill remarks will be perfect for, say, Gamora and her doll collection. When the characters return to their ship, the player can enter Gamora's room to activate a sequence where the two have a nice chat that really shows just how comfortable the characters are with each other. The conversations feel absurdly natural to contrast some of the plots' more wilder interactions, like an early argument between Rocket and Groot over who would be the better monster to sell between the two to pay off their debt. The banter and bickering during the missions is made greater as the story progresses, and tense relationships become more formal and downright friendly. There are also flashback sequences to showcase Peter's time before he became a galactic pirate. 
while also fleshing out some of the more emotional issues going on with each guardian. A big aspect about the game in terms of the players becoming more comfortable with the characters are choices. Presented many times are dialogue and even action choices for the player to pick. In the third chapter, Drax will grab Rocket in an effort to extend a bridge by pitching the raccoon across a gorge. The player can choose to support Drax or save Rocket, with the decision not only affecting the path taken afterward, but also Star-Lord and Rocket's relationship going forward. Other choices can actually have long-term effects, such as Quill supporting a little girl in over her head and being gifted a pass card that saves the player time when needing a code later in the game. Though choice is a big aspect in the game, it doesn't change the story in a major way after the fourth chapter, when the aforementioned decision to sell Groot or Rocket plays out in hilarious fashion. Technically, Guardians of the Galaxy is a mixed bag, even after several patches. On the positive side of things is how good the game looks and sounds. A majority of the game's environments are bright and varied, even if certain chapters put the protagonist in the static insides of some random ship, housing mass opposition and incredibly reflective floors. Lip syncing, facial, and body animations are mostly masterful. Every character has a particular air, cadence, and balance that makes them unique as a real person would, adding believability to this insane experience. A great Guardians game would have to rock in regards to its soundtrack. Thankfully, Square Enix seemingly wrote a bunch of blank checks so Idols Montreal could choose any song they wanted to be a part of the soundtrack. Heavy musical hitters like Europe's The Final Countdown, We're Not Gonna Take It by Twisted Sister, and even some new kids on the block with Hanging Tough perfectly captured Quill's musical heyday. Added to the soundtrack is the in-house band that inspired Peter Quill's space persona, who provides some fantastic tunes as well. The game's negative technical aspects boil down to things that hopefully will be fixed in the near future, beyond the random graphical and sound glitches like objects vibrating randomly or there being an odd delay when trying to close a text collectible, where moments like melee strikes not connecting when punching an enemy and defeated adversaries falling through the world and Peter being stuck in combat mode until the checkpoint was reloaded, forcing a battle that needs to be completed again. The camera can also be a problem, especially in close quarters, or when the player reaches the edge of an elevated platform without realizing it until Quill falls into the abyss. Hard crashes were few and far between, but did happen later in the game more than in the early hours. The oddest developer decision has to be the handling of chapter select. Unlike almost every game with Chapter Select that remembers choices and collectibles attained, Chapter Select solely acts as a way for the players to simply replay moments they enjoyed or get those combat-oriented trophies and achievements. For completionists, the only way to get everything they didn't get on their first playthrough, say all the outfits, is by using New Game Plus. This decision wouldn't be too bad if not for players suffering from the game actually resetting their gains when starting New Game Plus including losing all the collectible skills and perks they attained. Some players have even suffered from a full save deletion after completing the game once, meaning backup saves are a must before finishing the story. It also must be stated that this game has one of the worst final boss battles in recent memory. Guardians of the Galaxy doesn't reach the heights of Marvel's Spider-Man on the PlayStation 4 and 5, but avoids the major pitfalls of Marvel's Avengers. While it doesn't leave a lasting impression in terms of gameplay and combat, Guardians of the Galaxy succeeds in presenting a memorable narrative thanks to some hilarious and emotional character interactions, topped off by one of the best video game licensed soundtracks ever. Guardians of the Galaxy succeeds at bringing the source materials' memorable characters into another acceptable space in regards to character and narrative presentation that can breathe and really let the player understand the depths of every Guardians' emotional well. The gameplay, however, is pretty average, if not unremarkable, even with the special attacks, elemental weapons, and plethora of enemies. Though the combat is just acceptable and the technical issues are unpredictable, and the chapter select is executed terribly. 
The story and character presentations are too remarkable to ignore. For gamers not looking for a tense time fighting through hordes of enemies and just want to enjoy the absurdity of a teal colored warrior arguing with a raccoon about the latter getting wet while bashing some inferior foes every 15 minutes or so, we'll be right at home with this game. Gamers particularly wanting strenuous challenging gameplay who don't care for storytelling and a lot of dialogue should look elsewhere. Everyone else, however, will be enjoying this like two old friends reuniting to nervously sing karaoke at gunpoint. Perish! The trick is to get right <laughs> with the assist! No! Not again! Stop Raiders! Together till the end! What is he talking about? Oh, oh, oh! It, it's a song, right? It is. Of course it's a song! The one that was playing when Peter and me made our unbreakable blood oath. We did? Breakable blood oath? That is a serious commitment, Peter Quill. Oh, no, 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 whoa, whoa, wait, 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 of course, I, I remember. Y you, me, uh, the, the, the music tells you what, Peter. How about you and me? Storm ride together! One more time. Together till the end, now we look to the sky. Lightning strikes twice, now it's us to the fly. Sing with me, Vita! Driving through, through the pouring the rain. rain. Ride, Ride the song. Storm 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 Storm